We're living ever longer and healthier lives. Are we ready? Our extra decades impact everything from careers and couples to companies and countries. The old three-course meal of education, work, and retirement is morphing into a four-quarter feast. So how does knowing we're likely to have more life impact our thinking and planning for the journey? And how are companies adapting as both talent and consumers get older? I'm Aviva Wittenberg-Cox, and this is Four Quarter Lives. Four Quarter Lives initially focused on individuals role modeling the new third quarter. In this episode, however, I'm looking at the impact of longer lives on the one before, that normally insane phase of life, Q2, from 25 to 50. Kane Ella is founder and former CEO of UK-based digital transformation company Red Badger. Kevin McGuire was an executive with Google for almost a decade. As young fathers in Q2, they have made big career and life choices, in part to profit from planning and pacing longer lives and more gender balance couples differently, with more prioritization of work-family balance in Q2 than most prior generations of men. This is a tale familiar to many women, but may encourage listeners of all genders to rethink their Q2 career strategies. So welcome Kevin McGuire and Kane Ulla to Four Quarter Lives. Hi, Aviva. Hello. Thank you for having us. So I've got two wonderful gentlemen, both in Q2, both sort of I'll say politely, around 40, one in London, one in Barcelona. That's very much part of their stories. But I'm going to start with a quick intro to where they both began. So, Kane, do you want to, as our eldest here, do you want to launch us off into your, an intro into your Q1? Where were you born, into what kind of family, and how did that then imprint you? So, I was born in the south coast of the UK, so in Brighton to two wonderful parents, very working class upbringings. My dad was sort of half Indian, second generation Indian, lost both of his parents when he was very young, unfortunately. My mum was very, kind of came from a broken home that was quite poor. So it's a very, very working class family, but, you know, full of love. You know, both of my parents are a real influence on me with regard to how I parent and kind of that sort of stuff. Yeah, and then uh, they separated when I was eight, unfortunately. If they had the support that I have today and the knowledge, they probably wouldn't have done, you know. So kind of there were pros and cons to it. You know, I had more time with my father, who previously was doing three or four jobs, you know. When they separated, he carved out more time for me and... There was a lot of love in the home. There was obviously the cons of, you know, the impact of it and that sort of thing. So I think there was definitely positives and negatives. So, you know, the working class backgrounds, you know, you get to university, you've not got the network that some might have, you know, you've got a bit of imposter syndrome and those sorts of things that you then got to spend your first parts of your career (laughs) trying to overcome. But at the same time, you know, I never have considered myself disadvantaged in any way because of the loving family, the love that I had from both of them. So, you know, that was kind of my upbringing, really. It was kind of single parent home, but both of them very much still bringing me up as a team. So, you know, my mum still goes around my dad's house on a Monday and cooks his dinner for the week, like 30 years later. So, love it, you know, gives, love it. You know, gives you an it's idea a- of kind of the companionship so so very interesting like debate about what you got as the essentials what we need as we grow up and what we think we need and what you actually got and how much it nourishes your own parenting kevin what about you same yeah yeah interesting parallels honestly like working class upbringing grew up in north manchester son of two parents who moved over from Ireland when they were, you know, they kind of got married when they were, wow, 20, 21 and moved over. My, you know, they had three kids before they were 25, which to me seems wild. <laughs> now I have, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm knocking the, on the door of 40 and I've got two and I'm thinking, I realize I watched my parents grow up in front of me. And I don't think I really realized that until I had kids myself. Just, yeah, and, not, and a very kind of like normal Manchester upbringing, you know, just great city, big into music, kind of you know, really didn't 
ended up going to university in Manchester, kind of tried to spread my wings and went over to Queens in Belfast and then just realized pretty quickly I, I wanted to be back in Manchester. Did computer science, kind of went and then went and disappointed my parents by just going to work in a record shop for about three or four years and kind of completely and utterly just not using that university education in the slightest. And yeah, that kind of like, it's funny when looking at the quarters thing that that brought me up to like 25 years old, which is when I kind of like switched things into a different gear and the career took a, a real kind of move forward. So it's interesting. You both really have very grounded roots, one in love, one in place, fascinating, which have then nourished you. And so these you've both ended up again in rather parallel, fast track, techie first halves of your second quarter. So, Kevin, keep going. What did you do when you got out of the record shop? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I was funnily like I was in the record shop and I was kind of like looking for places that I wanted to work. And I was just searching around and there was a guy at the time that ran this blog about happiness at work. He turned himself like the chief happiness officer, Alexander Kirloff, I think his name was. He's probably still around. And there was a list of 10 great places to work and Google was high up the list. And I thought, well, of course I'd love to work at Google, but nobody works at Google, you know? Yeah, right. But then there was another, there was a company, a company called uh, What If, like an innovation agency in the vein of kind of like an IDEO type thing. And they were on the list as well. And I realized they had an office in Manchester. I was like, huh, that's an, that's interesting. And I kind of went there and, and did my work and managed to convince them to bring me on and, and got a job there. And then met a woman there who had worked in PR and had actually placed the article with that person that I ended up marrying and having two children with in a, <laughs> in a strange kind of twist of fate. Very and nice. then, yeah, you know, and that brought me down to London. I did my time in various different ad agencies. And then when I was about just a, yeah, about 10 or 12 years ago or so, my last client was Google and this uh, wonderful woman who became a bit of a mentor to me and just said to me, Hey, I think you would do really well here. And I have a role here and I think you should go for it. And that was kind of making that jump to eight years of Google, which I started in London, ended up taking me out to San Francisco where I realized that it wasn't, I was on a, track that I didn't really want to be on. In London, it was very easy to be, I was surrounded by people that I felt like are very like me and we were motivated by the same things and we were into very similar stuff. And then I got to San Francisco and I, I kind of felt like everyone was motivated by ambition, really. There was like the level of ambition there was way beyond what I had previously experienced at any place in my career. And I realized that, you know, when you're inside a big company like that, where everything is around performance reviews and everyone is graded on this scale, that ambition and progress become zero sum. And in order for one person to succeed, another person must not. And you could see the, you could see the signs of that everywhere. It came at a similar time where I hadn't really, you know, my daughter was born in London and then she was around three, three and a half. I remember having this incredibly intense time at work and not seeing her for ages. And then you're trying to basically be a good parent in two most stressful times of the day, like seven to 8 a.m. and seven to 8 p.m. And you're trying to be a good parent in those two hours. And those two hours are the worst time. As any parent knows, those two hours are like the worst time of the day, full stop. So you're, you're kind of, you're being a parent, but you're not really present and you're kind of answering emails and pings and back and forth. And I just, and I had this realization, I thought, Hey, you know, right now my daughter, she thinks I am the best thing in the world. Like she's three, she thinks I'm amazing. And I could look in this laptop and I could spend another 10 years in this laptop, sat in the Gmail interface and then look up from it. And she's a teenager and she doesn't want to spend time with me anymore. And I just thought, I've got to pull the rip cord. And me and my wife just went, let's make a change. So two really interesting pressures working in tandem. One is actually this disaffection with the values of the system you found yourself in and this extraordinarily driving ambition at the same time that your own ambition to be a parent was wildly underserved. Kane, I think that probably creates a few echoes. Can you share what your first half fast track techie successful journey was and then how it felt? Yeah, crazy parallels. I also did computer science in Manchester. Uh, <laughs> spent many, many hours in Eastern Bloc buying records uh, <laughs> on Oldham Street. You probably <laughs> bought them from him. Yeah. You know, I was Piccadilly Records across the road the other day. Yeah, yeah. I still order records from Piccadilly Records. I'm mail order, but obviously not been there for a while. So really bizarre. 
Yeah, so I did computer science at university. And on my mum's side, I was the first person in her family to go to university. And then I got a grad grad kind of recruit. I just went to a grad fair and I got my first job working for a financial software house, but as a product management consultant. So I've not written a line of code since graduating. And that took me to London. So I've been in London for you know 20 years now, since 2002. And then I ended up a company called Conchango, and that's where the that's where the uh, imposter syndrome really set in because it was like you look left and you look right, and it was just brilliant people everywhere. And I realised then that I was quite far behind, and I was winging it to try and uh, catch up. But catch up, I did. You know, I, I developed a huge amount actually, sort of between twenty six and thirty, just working at Conchango had really inspirational bosses you know two in particular that were just you know still inspire me in how I lead today actually they were really really brilliant and then Kinchango was acquired so it went from 350 people to full part of a 40,000 person organization overnight it was acquired by EMC which is now part of Dell um, and just the culture just just plummeted there was kind of a tidal wave of people exiting that business. So Stu and Dave, my co-founders of Red Badger, we were working on a really cool project at Conchango. We agreed that we would finish that, but then also started planning our exit. And so I literally 10.30 went to Berlin and the day I got back to Conchango, I resigned just five days after my third year. And we all set up Red Badger with you know, £10,000 each, worked from our bedrooms, didn't really know what we were doing, <laughs> but, you know, we kind of had a, an outline of the values that we wanted to run the business by and um, kind of what we wanted to achieve and how we would be different. But, you know, everything else, really, we just kind of were being entrepreneurs for the first time. We just had to make it up as we went along. And we've grown. So that's, that was 12 years ago now. And we sort of grown organically to 140 people, you know, around 18 million revenue. The thing for me when we started Red Badger, it was all about elevating careers. The three founders kind of sat down. It was like, what do we each individually want to get out of this? And what's the focus? And for me, it was about elevating careers. I wanted the business to be somewhere where young people come. It's an incubator for growing them in, as individuals and their skills and that sort of stuff, but then celebrating the alumni, you know, really kind of appreciating Red Badger's role in the whole career and not kind of trying to hold on to them for longer than is right for them. And that's probably what I'm most proud of about Red Badger is the kind of the careers that we've developed, actually. We've done loads of great client work, but the, the careers that we've developed and the things that some of them have gone on to do is amazing. So, so what fascinating <laughs> parallels and contrasts, right? The both of you kind of in these high performing organizations, but Kane, your company was a little bit one of your first babies, one that you managed to imprint with your values rather than Kevin, you you got into a place you you had long admired but discovered a misalignment of values. So you've both pivoted quite dramatically at not totally dissimilar ages, right? And I'm curious, it was probably more of a process for you. I, I watched you do this very, very carefully over some time. What, what made you decide to change the priorities? Yeah, so kind of Red Badger for me personally was always felt like it was going to be 10 years. And, you know, and then I wanted to kind of contribute externally you know i was elevating using red badger to elevate careers but then what actually how can i expand that to outside of red badger but it's something that actually my wife and i planned for a number of years so you know probably four years before we had children tash you know, gave up her pr career and she was a director of a pr company because and retrained as a coach because she wanted flexibility and to run her own business when we do have children. And then that happened in four years later. And we also sort of discussed what it would mean for me, you know, and what I want personally, you know, and the love and the nourishment that relationships at home and having kids can bring and trying to break the stereotype of a man providing and being out working five days a week whilst the wife does all of the parenting and that sort of stuff. So, 
it was planned that me sort of stepping down as CEO and going down to three days a week. I'm still involved at Red, in Red Badger three days a week and on the board. But having I've effectively doubled the time that I have with my children because I'm at home with them Thursday, Friday, as well as Saturday, Sunday. And that was planned over a period of about six years before it actually, you know, four, four or five years before it actually happened. And I'm kind of 18 months in now. So it's been about six years. Well, that's fascinating, right? I mean, I don't think too many people have a, such a clear Q2 strategy of I'm going to build something with these values. And then those values are actually going to drive my pivot that I'm strategically going to design with my partner. Kevin, I think you came to a, a not dissimilar pivot, maybe maybe a little less planned from the sounds of it. <laughs> Give us your version. I'd say a lot less planned. I'd say it was a I'd say it was more like the Top Gun movie scene when the plane is going down and they just hit the button. They're like, get me out of this thing right now. Like, boom, hit the eject <laughs> and escape. I think, you know, it's funny, that point you raised before, Viva, about like the values of the organization. I think for the, you know, the ambition, the, the thing that drove me at first was getting that job. It was like, okay, this is the company. This is where I want to be. And then you get there and it's like, okay, well, what am I going for now? What comes next now that I got the thing that I, that I wanted, that I really pushed myself to like ruling interviews and to get through the whole thing? What's next? And then you end up inside an organization. And I think I just, I made the mistake of taking what they saw progression and advancement to be as my own. And I kind of internalized, I rebelled against it for a little while before many different people internally and kind of managers and mentors saying, Hey, you know, you just got to kind of go with this and you might not completely want to do it this way, but this is the game that you've got to play and doing that for a good chunk of time. And, you know, and of course being like well compensated for it. I remind people often of that word compensation that they use to mean salary, but it also like there are many different meanings for the word compensation and you are being compensated for your time. You're being compensated for everything else that you give up. You know, I remember a very memorable dinner with a friend. We'd both taken these kind of like big, like intense jobs inside tech companies. And we, and we went for dinner together and he turned to me and he said, you know, I don't want, I hope you don't take this in the wrong way, but you used to be a lot more interesting. <laughs> And he was right. Like he really was. He said, you know, you used to run that website and you used to run that club night and you used to do all of these different things. And now you just do this job. And he was right. And it, but yep. it is. And it's, it's true when you, you So what give was the yourself, moment? Was there a light bulb moment? I mean, in I contrast think were, to, Kane, to Kane's six year plan strategy. Yeah, they're def, like, that's amazing, Kane, to, to kind of have that level of kind of like foresight and forward thinking into it. And I suppose you have to when you're you're running a company and there are like however many people that are dependent on on that company, you can't just pull the ripcord and say, see ya, I'm off to Bali, like see you in four years. But I, I think if you're honest, it was much more a collection of things that happened along the way that when I look back on them, they were all markers of the decision that when the decision came around, it felt inevitable. But, you know, I remember my parents, when I lived in San Francisco, my parents came out for a week. They came out for a week one time and I pretty much didn't see them for the entire time. I was on a big launch at the, at the time, some new app that was, some new app that was coming out at the time that was the most important thing in the world at that moment to very many people. And now it isn't even around anymore four years later in typical kind of like Google tech fashion, but as a big learning for life that the thing that you're freaking out and stressed out about right now, probably it might not even be here in a few years time and just not seeing my family and then not seeing, not really spending as much time with my daughter as I wanted to. And, and my wife and I both in these insanely busy, stressful jobs where we were on paper being paid more than we'd ever been paid in our life. And at the end of the month, you look at the bank balance and you kind of don't have like two pennies to rub together because the cost of living in that place is so extreme. So just, I think there's like a series of events along the way that just made me realize that this, that I wasn't on the right path anymore. You had a pretty big pivot. I mean, then you fly off and change country. Yeah. And it's funny. Like I, I where did you go? The, what did you do? Well, actually like one of the big pivotal moments I have to say is I worked with a coach in 2016. I met a guy in a friend's kitchen at a barbecue 
and the conversation went to, as conversations in San Francisco and most of the US always end up going to, the first thing he wanted to know is, what do you do? And I told him that I'm in this tech job and I don't really want to do it anymore, but I don't know what's next. And he told me he was just, just finished training as a coach and that maybe we should talk about what happens next. And that process just led me to say, I'm going to take a sabbatical. I'm going to take a sabbatical from work, but knowing that there's probably a 50% chance that I'll come back. And we packed all of our life up. We put it into a... Thankfully, we had some family in the Bay Area. and they, they let us take over their loft and put everything that we owned into their loft. And then we booked a one-way flight to Tokyo and a 21-day bullet train pass for the three of us. And we just made it up from there. And we spent kind of six months together as a family. My daughter turned my daughter turned four in South Korea. We took her to Hello Kitty World for her birthday. It was super cute. <laughs> we just spent like a, re- a huge amount of time together and just opened my eyes to how wonderful it can be. And it, of course, it comes with a, a huge amount of privilege and being able to take that time off work and, you know, to have worked. It took a lot out of me being at that place. Yeah. And I look back now and so, realize so that there was every sign of burnout, like every yeah. single sign of burnout was there. Yeah. So burnout is often a, a Q2 phenomenon. And increasingly, we're hearing it more and more. And so as both of you very intentionally enter your 40s, I'm going to ask you just, and Kate, I'm coming back to you because you're obviously carefully designing and preparing and thinking about this. What what are the priorities for this decade, which I call, and maybe you don't look at it quite that way, I call the last decade of the first half of your career. And yeah. all the you know, and so many you know, and all of Q three yet to come. So, what's the short term goal? What's the the rest of the forties gonna look like? What are your what are you setting the stage for? Well, so first and foremost, home life is my priority. You know, and making sure I'm still really leaning into the, my the formative years of my children and being a good husband. And, and you've got two, right? Two yeah, young. Yeah, just turn three and a just turn one year old. So in the eye of the storm, <laughs> it's all great fun, very destructive. Yeah, but really, really good fun. So, you know, that is my priority. And I'm obviously still in Red Badger at, at the moment. But I think that will probably become less over time. And then I feel like my Q3 is going to be about teaching. So giving back, advising, helping other entrepreneurs. And so really it's starting to dip my toe into building that kind of experience, I think, in the last sort of decade of my Q2, as well as kind of trying to work out, I'm really passionate about sustainability. So trying to work out how I can do that, but also contribute to society and the environment in some way. Now, you're obviously out on the course that Rose Advanced Leadership course. So that, that is definitely a life goal for me as well, Aviva. <laughs> I'm um, glad. <laughs> Don't, yeah. <laughs> it's a good life goal to have right around the beginning of Q3. It's just perfect for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm so intrigued because I'm talking to two men who are basically sounding incredibly similar to all the women that I've talked to for the last 30 years who were making quite similar choices, but it was incredibly rare to have their partner join them in that pacing. And Kane, you're doing it so intentionally. Kevin, I think you swept into this. How's your pivot? Describe your plans for this next decade as you're just moving into your 40s. Yeah, I mean, I think it's fascinating how much today's dads can learn from the mums of generations past. You know, I think that the the topics that Kane and I are talking about and that we're kind of wrestling with, and I think a lot of dads wrestle with today, absolutely echo the conversations and the that mums have been having for at least 50 years, if not more. And, you know, I think there's a lot that we can learn from trying to juggle and having it all and how do I be a good dad but also be present at work and get promoted or how do I kind of achieve and feel successful in my career whilst I can still be kind of home for bath time and bedtime you know for me I think a big chunk of what's become kind of like a driving force and definitely like a capital P purpose has been the new fatherhood so this is a newsletter I started two years ago and around the time of the pandemic trying to think you know, what do I want to do? And looking around and thinking, you know, there's really, there isn't a lot of writing out there that speaks to my experience as a father and around trying to balance, you know, just being present and actually just being emotionally available for my children and 
I decided to start it myself. I thought I'd write a book. I did not have the courage of my convictions to write a book or to go away for a year and work on something that nobody would see and then hope that people would like at the end of it. And I think I, you know, with a background in technology and kind of knowing that this newsletter wave was was kind of riding high, I, I just said, I'm going to commit myself to a year of writing once a week. And it has done amazing things. And it has brought me kind of like into the orbit of other interesting people like yourself, Aviva, who are doing kind of great work in this space. And I think when you when you write on the internet and you put yourself out there in a way that is vulnerable and you kind of talk about the whole experience, it really, it kind of acts as a lighthouse and it brings interesting people towards you. And that's really what the, as I move into, as I kind of move into my forties, I kind of, I get the feeling over the last two years writing this, I, I, you know, my inbox is full of dads every day saying, thank you. Thank you for writing this. I just came across this thing. And I wrote this, I wrote an essay about how to choose where to live. Okay. And I developed a little model. I'm a, I'm a strategist. Like my real job is like brand strategist and ad land planner. So I, I'll always go to a Venn diagram all the time. Like if, if I can, if I can explain things in a Venn, I'll explain things in a Venn. And I did this little model of how you choose where to live and you choose your priorities. And this guy got in touch with me and he said, Oh, I, me and my wife, we sat down with your worksheet and we sat down and we did it and we've, we made a decision and we moved into Manchester and I was like, Oh wow. That is, and I, I had to go back and check Ow. my working. I was like, is Ow. it sure that you, yeah. And they went, no. And they went, you know, we, we prioritized proximity to family and outside space and being able to be kind of have a nice place. And I'm in touch with the guy still and he's doing great there. And he, but I, I felt this insane level of pressure that I wanted him to land. Okay. And I think where it's moving me towards, and it's funny, like the, okay, and the, the parallel is very interesting. I think you, you know, you said about your wife has moved into coaching is that's where I feel like my kind of gravity is leaning towards. So I've been going through training over the last six months and I'm kind of going to start offering coaching in the new year, not exclusively for dads, but specifically like working with men who are trying to integrate these disparate elements of work and of career, of being at home, of passions and like all these different things that I think men don't really take time to focus on and looking at as part of how holistically they all work together. I think we're very good at going career. Okay, go career. I want to do this. I want to get to this point. I want to earn this amount of money. I want to, and it's all kind of like external markers and external validations of where you are in life versus, and I think Kane, you'd probably feel the same. It's like more of the like, what is the internal scorecard? What are the kind of like internal ways that you're marking yourself as whether you are succeeding? I'm doing the air quotes, but you kind of can't see. But like success means something so different for me today than it did even five years ago. And I th- I'm sure success will mean something completely different in five years again. But I feel like I'm defining it on my own terms now and not on the terms of that someone else is in control of. And so interesting that um, it's through experimentation. For one, it's through starting your own company, self-expression. Kevin, you got to self-expression through writing um, and your Substack, which I will put in the show notes, the new fatherhood on Substack is a wonderful introduction into this whole new world of men discovering and being liberated to express themselves and discover themselves without these traditional gender roles, which must be incredibly freeing. But what I'm curious about is what was the reaction? It takes a certain amount of courage still, I think, for men to tell other men that they're heading in these directions. What's been the reaction from professional partners, bosses, colleagues, your friends? Kevin, you might have got less boring, (laughs) Kane. Did you you get any kind of feedback that either really encouraged you or or shocked you as you made these moves? Who's who first? King, go ahead. Okay. So, well, friends and family were, you know, proud of me, extremely happy for me, you know, mentors like you, Aviva, you know, who sort of coached me through the process to a degree, you know, because they knew how hard I'd worked to engineer, if you like. It was a privilege. Like, Like you said, Kevin, it is a privilege, but to engineer the opportunity to be at home more. So they were really proud of me. I think my business partners found it difficult. You know, it's almost like, you know, I was leaving them. It's kind of like we we're going through a, a divorce to a degree. So they found it hard, but, you know, we worked through it and came out the other side. But it wasn't plain sailing from that perspective when you're building something with, 
you know, two people you spent more time with as adults than anyone else on the planet. And then all of a sudden, one of you kind of wants to extricate yourself. That was challenging. And then kind of the public at large, you know, I wrote a blog on LinkedIn like saying, you know, I'm stepping down as CEO and I want to support my wife's career and parent. And, and it's really interesting. You know, most, most people were very supportive, but others were kind of like, why is this news? If I was a woman, you wouldn't even bother writing the blog, so why are you? And that, I found that really interesting, actually, which kind of says a lot about the kind of perceptions and the stereotypes of the role of a man and actually the sort of the bitterness, if you like it. I wasn't writing it because it was news. I was writing it because I wanted to inspire other dads to do the same. But there was definitely a bit of a negative reaction in small pockets about me and if uh, promoting or talking about something that women do every day all over the place, you know, and that was quite, quite humbling, actually, for me. And just to make, make me think, actually, you know, I do want to inspire other men, but we also can't forget that women are doing this all the time and have done for many years, you know, so it's quite very, very interesting. But mostly it is very, very positive And my friends and family and colleagues are really supportive. Yeah, because I can imagine that there's both envy, hey, jealousy, that, that... anger, all kinds of mixed emotions, right, as this kind of new roles for men pop up. As you say, it's a privilege. Not everybody can even afford to do this or be able to do it or have the partners who are willing to let them in in that way. Kevin, did your friend who found you boring encourage you <laughs> to become more interesting again? <laughs> <laughs> you did. I was going to before I jump into it. Kane did. I was going to ask on the. You got some negative feedback on the post. Was there a gender split in who was giving it? Did it mainly come from men or women? Overwhelmingly, the negative feedback was from women. Definitely, it wasn't a lo- there wasn't a lot of it, but you know, most most of the women were really happy for me and thought it was amazing. But then some others were of the opinion that. You know, well, other women do this. Why is it even news? You know, all men should be sharing the parenting, shouldn't they? You know, it's quite a, yeah. it's quite interesting, quite interesting response that I hadn't, yeah. hadn't considered or foresaw. So it's definitely interesting, and it opened up some interesting conversation as well. Yeah, I think Kevin, so. I think, like, Kevin, did you, did you, know, you, did my, you inspire you know, or, or uh, shock? <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, my, I think my wife and my family have been so supportive of, of doing this. I think, you know, lots of people ask questions because, of course, you're, you're leaving the job that everybody wants to have, you know. And I can remember sat in a kitchen with a friend and I said, because he was considering leaving his job as well, similar thing, different friend, same company. And I said, are we crazy? Are we crazy doing this? Like, we're leaving the job that everybody wants. Like what? And he said, no, I think that aren't we lucky that we're, you know, we're both in our mid thirties and we've already got the thing that everybody wants and realized it's not what it's all cracked up to be. And it's not enough. It's interesting. I think the the thing that's consistently come across from having discussions with people is I think there are two mindsets. I think there is a mindset of more and there is a mindset of enough. I think the Swedish use this word lagom, which is an old word that comes from when they used to drink out of the same big tanker together. And you would say lagom when you were done and you would pass it on to the next person. And lagom just means enough. It took me a long time to get there. But I think when you move from that mindset of more to enough, it just changes the way you see everything. And I think people who are still in that mindset of more can look at people who have who are in the space of enough and it doesn't compute. It's almost like, well, why would you leave that place? Why would you not, you know, like, why would you not try and earn as much as you can? You know, if you only worked another 30 hours a week, you could maybe earn double the money. And it's like, no, 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 but I don't need, like, those hours are the ones that I get to spend with my kid. Those hours are the ones that I write. Those hours are the, those are the ones that I can just kind of like take an afternoon off and go for a walk in the mountains. And there's no, like, it's very hard to put a price on something like that. It's impossible to do it in a place like San Francisco. It's hard to do it in a place like London as well, when you're kind of like surrounded in the speed and and what everything's going. It's definitely easier in a place like this where people just want to like finish work at two o'clock on a Friday and go to the beach with a six pack and sit around with their friends and play some beach volleyball or beach tennis. And it's kind of, it's a, a different pace of life entirely but it's a pace of life that definitely suits where i've moved to as i'm in this kind of if not q3 then definitely the the second mountain part of q2 <laughs> and very interesting since you're both technologists that tech has so much enabled people to change place and the impact of that place and culture 
on the kind of choices that you're making. And I would argue that you're not actually making these choices late, that it took you a long time. You're actually doing it quite early. I mean, very often, traditionally, men have woken up to a midlife crisis in their 50s when they've already missed some of what you guys are claiming as your birthright, which is fascinating, right? I think the fact that you've got it before it's too late is one of the most intriguing parts of this story and the narrative that you're offering. And maybe that's where we can end is, Kane, you're raising two young boys. What do you hope will be different when it's their turn? Anything? Well, well, I hope society is different for a start where men conforming uh, to the stereotypes is different. And But if society hasn't moved on in the way in which we would hope where, you know, those things are not the norm, I want them to... I'll, do my best to educate them that none of it's true. And actually they can shape what success looks like for themselves. And it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks or what society says should be the definition of success for them. And so that's, for me, they can have autonomy over sort of the direction of doing what they love and that sort of stuff without having the pressures of external pressures of what others think they should be doing. Then that's what I want to be different for them for sure that would be success as a parent for me if they can you know feel that sort of freedom very often kids don't do what you tell them right they do what you are and so the models that you guys are offering them is probably the biggest gift especially for boys that you can offer but kevin you've got a daughter i think do you have a son as well i do i have i have a girl and a boy so my daughter is a and my my son is three and it's been really interesting you know you as kind of like progressive left-wing parents, you try and, you know, you do the thing of raising them outside of gender roles and just trying to be quite kind of balanced about things. But then you see these things occur and, you know, like he will be more boisterous, whereas she was kind of much more calm and she will like go and play in herself and he'll just kind of want to crash superheroes around. (laughs) I think there's... and as um, There is a difference. There is a difference. Yeah, there there is a difference. And I think... (laughs) You know, and there are, you know, as progressive as we might feel we are, there are, we don't represent all of society. And, you know, we live in a country where I think gender roles are a lot more traditional, let's say, in here in Spain than they are in somewhere like London. But we just try and do our best. And I think my daughter, we were walking into the house yesterday and she said, Papi, she calls me Papi, because that's like the Spanish thing that Papi she says, Papi, are you happy with your life? <laughs> Good question. And I was like, wow, wow oh, yeah, wow, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I, I really am. I said, I've, I said, I think I'm happier with my life right now than I've ever been at any point in my life. I really feel like I'm, you know, with this new fatherhood work, with the, with the stuff I'm doing with dads, I really feel like I found the reason I was put on this earth. And I said to her, I said, are you happy with your life? She's eight years old. And she was like, yeah, I am. I'm happy with my life too. I said, remember this conversation because I'm going to check back in on you. And I'll check back in on you in five years and 10 years and maybe 20 years. And I'll, and I'll ask you because I think if, if she can grow up and if she can be happy with her life and if I can raise children who are kind of kind, empathetic, curious, just genuinely good human beings who are happy with, with where they are in life, I will feel like I've done a good job as a parent. And I think it's also this free, the gift that underlies what you're offering your children is nonconformity, right? You are not bowing to the pressures and stereotypes by the very existence you've chosen to have. So I'm curious, you've still got so much time ahead, and you know I'm going to ask you for a metaphor or a sentence that summarizes each of your four quarters those that came behind you and those that are yet to come. Kevin, you want to give it a roll? What, it, what would be your four quarters? Yeah. Quarters? So it's funny, like I, I was thinking about this and I, I originally thought of like, I'm a terrible gardener. Basically like anything I bring into the house, I kill, but I, 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 I want to get better at it. And, I, and I, I immediately went to kind of the, the growth metaphor. And I was thinking of this kind of, you know, like small tree that kind of grew into something bigger and started to create its own fruit. And I realized that as I'm moving forward into my 40s and into what I think Q3 will be is I'm starting to think of myself less as the tree and more of kind of an orchard worker that sits amongst the kind of like group of trees that are all trying to grow their heart. And I'm trying to create the best conditions for them to grow and trying to create the chance for them to fruit 
And, you know, like when a, a tree fruits and it can provide sustenance and kind of love and joy for the people around it. So it kind of like move into that idea of, okay, what does it look like if I'm the person out there helping these trees to grow and, and to be the best they can be? Love it. Cade, what about you? What are you Like, tell you're a creative, Demi. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so he can do a logo. Sure and poetic. And, yeah. <laughs> 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 my, my, I chose four words for my each stages. The first one was really exploration. It's kind of under, understanding myself, really. Second quarter was growth. So really sort of growing as an individual, as an entrepreneur, as a partner, now as a parent, you know, and that will never stop. I feel like my future one. So the next one, third quarter, I'm keen on the teaching aspect and I don't don't really know what Q4 has in store for me it's a long way away but maybe learning again yeah so exploration growth teaching and learning okay, learning I, I yeah. think that's a beautiful series so but be, between all of your growth and fruit and uh, spreading the joy yeah. I want to celebrate both of you and thank you for coming and sharing the models and the innovations that you're bringing because I think you're nourishing not just your children but kids boys and all of us everywhere thank you oh thank, thank you for you. bringing us together it was good to chat Kane I'll be over in London soon and we'll, we'll get a coffee definitely we can share some uh, favourite records. Uh, uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> and remember to check out Kevin Maguire's New Fatherhood newsletter every week on Substack. Thanks to both of you. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you. For more thinking about the impact of our four quarter lives, you can read my column at Forbes and subscribe to my Elderberries newsletter on Substack. Let's design lives that aren't just longer, but better.